Good morning, everybody. We hope you're having a really good day so far. Um, we are going to get started in about two minutes, but I wanted to go ahead and let everybody in. If you are having any issues hearing me, please put a comment in the questions box so that we can address that. You are on and you cannot hear me, please let Amy know in the questions box. But if you can hear me, then you are good to go. All right, so it is right at nine o'clock and in an interest of time, yours and ours, we would like to go ahead and get started. Uh, today I have with me Amy Hammond, who's gonna manage the questions box. Um, my name is Kara Poli. I'm going to be the presenter today, and then I do have uh, some folks with us in um, kind of the background. I have Wendy Quackenbush and uh, Carolyn Metzger, and then Christina Thompson is also with us today, um, and they might jump in on any questions that they would like to answer or have any feedback on. So the, this is the Average Income Set Aside webinar. You guys have been requesting this. Final guidance came out, so now we have got um, kind of all the bits and pieces of the puzzle that we need to put together and um, give you kind of a big picture of how we're going to monitor for this and how this is going to work. Um, as always, we have to give you our contact information. We've got our mailing address if you ever need to send us anything. And then our physical address if you want to see um, the beautiful building in which we operate. It's really going to be probably a letdown. However, it is across the street from the Capitol. It does look like a state building. Um, and it is where all the magic happens. So feel free to drive by and wave if you're ever downtown Austin. Uh, we do have a new website and I say new because it's the old one was there for so long. This one will be new for a little bit. So if you have not made yourself familiar with the new website, which is www.tdhca.texas.gov, you will wanna do that. It does have a search engine that works really well. So that is pretty helpful um, as well. We do have um, the Multifamily Compliance Division phone number there is that 8869 number. You can reach out to us anytime through that. You may have to leave a voicemail or ask for a monitor, um, but that if you leave a voicemail, it'll get forwarded out to one of us and we will respond um, as soon as we're able to. The best way to get in touch with any of us is going to be through email. There is also a main line toll-free number there that gets to kind of the information box of the department. And those folks will also forward your message out. So if you wanted to save those in your phone in case you have a, a compliance crisis and need to leave a message in a hurry, you can do that um, at either of those numbers. The way today is gonna work, if you have not been with us for an office hours before, um, we are going to do this average income specific webinar from about 9 until 10 or 10.30, kind of depending on how many questions you guys have um, and how um, wordy Amy or I get. Sometimes we do a lot of explaining, um, which is good for you guys because it gets all the questions answered, we hope. Then at about 10.30, we're going to shift gears into an open forum office hours where you can ask any question you want to about any, really any topic. And if we don't know the answer, well, any compliance TDHCA type topic. Um, so if we don't know the answer, we're going to get you to somebody that does, but we're going to do our best to answer those questions. We record the webinar part. We do not record the um, office hours. So you will not have an you will not have access to those questions after they're asked. But if you want to stay on with us until noon, that's a great way to hear kind of what else other people are seeing in the field. And we if if there's um, dead air, so, so to speak, or no questions, Amy and I will kind of talk about some different things going on. And then Manuel Pena from our physical inspections group also joins us for that. And he will sometimes jump in and talk to us about what's going on in their world. We will take a break when we shift gears from the average income webinar into the open forum um, topics. 
so that will it'll be about a five minute break just to kind of give me a chance to switch powerpoints turn off the recording and that sort of a thing staff will be available from now until noon today to answer questions if you ask questions this morning that do not pertain to average income amy's probably going to ask you to table that until the open forum but we will get to it during the open open forum she may also answer it in the questions box or ask you to email us kind of depending on the nature of your question a little bit of housekeeping today certificates will not be emailed to you you will get an email that says hey thank you for joining us if you did not use your login or you have um, peers or coworkers that were not able to join us today you will get an email or those folks will get an email that says we're sorry that you missed us and it'll have the link for the recording please check your junk folders we cannot reissue those emails um, so if you work for a company or have a compliance group that's asking you to uh, send those in as proof of attendance you will need to do that that would be something you would be responsible for i don't have access to resend those or create certificates or anything like that i would encourage you to silence your phones and put it out of office for this little bit of a training that we've got this morning that'll help with distractions um, I know everybody's busy. I know it's mid-month. You guys have a lot going on, um, but we want you to get the most you can out of this webinar. As I stated before, Amy Hammond is managing the questions box for us this morning, and um, so any questions can come to her through that, and then she will let me know when we need to have those out loud. We'll stop periodically throughout the webinar, and um, she will ask some of them out loud if, because a lot of them are going to benefit the whole group. And then others she might just answer in the questions box. There are some department resources that we want to be sure you're aware of. We've got our compliance forms listed and some of those have changed. So you may want to take a look at that. I think the asset certification form was the most recent one that changed. And so that's going to be the most recent one you'd want to download. It's, or it has not been uploaded yet. It's being translated. It's now. being translated. Okay, so that will be one that's changing. Um, and it'll be uploaded to that form section. Manuals and rules are on there and we link to the different things that would help. We don't do a state compliance manual, but we try to make sure that our rules read as if they were a compliance manual, so to speak, so that it can tell you exactly kind of what to do and what to expect. The utility allowance information, those forms did get updated back in July. So if you're still using the February forms, probably go to the website and get the new ones. We made some, um, accessibility changes and some um, you know contact information changes and updates to that um, the income and rent limits are on our website and there is a cool new income and rent tool hopefully everybody's familiar with that because that's been out for just a minute um, but that is there and available all of the recorded presentations go to the compliance program training presentations link that you'll see there and then as i mentioned on the previous slide it is easier to contact us through email and that contact list is available at that link you see at the bottom. So I do have a poll. We don't usually have polls on these, but I have a poll. I wanted to try to get a good gauge of our audience. So I'm gonna launch this poll right now, and it's just gonna ask, do you own, operate, or manage an average income development? We kind of wanna get a feel for who's, who's in our audience today. Looks like a lot of folks have them, and a good chunk are wanting to be prepared for it. All right, it looks like the responses have kind of um, slowed. So I'm going to close this poll and I'm going to share it. It looks like about three quarters of you are at an average income deal or involved in an average income deal. Um, a handful of you are not, and that's okay. It never hurts to learn new things. And then there is a group of you that are not, um, that do not have average income at this time, but want to be prepared. So that's really great. And um, we're glad you're with us today. Please be aware this is a very set aside specific training. We don't usually do those, but with average income being relatively new um, and having kind of some different nuances, this is um, why we have built this training and put this together for you guys as a resource. 
So the Consolidated Appropriations Act of 2018 added section 42 little g one big C, which contains a third minimum set aside test option called the average income test or AIT. If a taxpayer elects to apply the average income test, that means that the project is going to meet an average income test of 40% or more of the low income units that are both rent restricted and occupied by tenants whose incomes do not exceed an average of 60%. So we're gonna take all of the set asides that folks qualify at and we're going to average those out. You didn't think you were gonna need eighth grade math, but here it comes again. And then you're gonna make sure that that stays at or below that 60% average or lower if required um, by, the, by your state documentation. Some additional guidance provides special rules relating to the limitation for the average income test. So unlike the 20 at 50 and the 40 at 60 tests, this type of designation requires the owner or the taxpayer to designate each unit's imputed income limitation that's taken into account for purposes of the average income test. That basically just means, hey, you need to know what your units are gonna be leased at. You need to have a plan for this so you can meet that 60%. And then you need to constantly maintain those and you need to keep in your books and records that that has, that has been met at the end of each year. Um, this also requires that the average of the imputed income limitations designated does not exceed 60%. So that's kind of a lot of words to tell you that the low income units that make up the project, 40% of those have to be at or below, and as an average, that 60% of area median income. The last thing that the new guidance um, included is that the designations can be 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, or 80 percent of the area median income. So that opens us up to a lot more options. So if you're in an area where you were always having to turn folks away um, because they were at that, they were above the 60, but maybe they weren't above 70 or 80, and if you'd have had this option, that would have been there. And so maybe you as an owner or you as a management company have taken on some properties in those areas where this is beneficial. Maybe it was a RAD conversion. We've seen these on a lot of different things. Um, so we've kind of, we've got a handful of these, I think in, in the pipeline now. Some, I know I did a second review on a couple of them already. So they're, they're definitely there and you guys are, I think for the most part have a grasp on it, but this is just gonna be a good extra uh, resource. So again, there are three options for the minimum set aside. The one we're talking about today is the average income set aside where 40% of the units within the project are both income and rent restricted and, av and average at or below 60% of the area median income. Remember the minimum set aside is calculated based on the number of units regardless of the unit size and is tested on the last day of each tax year. The project is defined on line 8B of form 8609 and each bin is issued in 8609. The owner is then responsible for completing part two, which includes this election for the projects. If the project contains multiple buildings, the owner is responsible for the attachment to form 8609 that defines the project. If you don't have 8609s yet, we are going to treat every building as an individual project. Again, the designations are 80% all the way down to 20%. They need to be dispersed across all unit types and throughout the property. So what we don't wanna have is folks calling us saying, hey, all the 20% are in this back building that looks at uh, the train tracks or the uh, you know, gas station that's behind the property or close by the property or it looks at the dumpsters. Don't do that. They need to be spread out. They need to be dispersed across all of the unit types and throughout the property. Amy, are there any questions or comments now? Nothing right now. Okay. So as with other set-asides, it is outlined in your land use restriction agreement. And you can see on this one that there are 170 units and that 170 units are gonna be treated as low income. This is gonna further explain that 100% of the units do not exceed an average of 60%. So that right there is our clue that this is an average income development. And then further in the same section where it talks about the um, veterans marketing if required and the supportive services and that sort of stuff, that is also gonna list out that this is an average income designation or set aside rather. I apologize, my throat's getting dry. So you can see there again, that tells us that 100% of the units 
are going to be leased and the average is not going to exceed 60% for the property. So there's kind of two pieces here. Every project has to be an average, has to have 40% of the units at average 60% or less. And then for the LURA requirements, the whole property has to average 60% uh, or less. Here is another example where it's 100% housing tax credit still, but now it's not 60%, it's 54%. So now our property has got to have a total average of 54%, while each project still federally has to have that 40% of units average 60% or less. And we're going to look at some examples of this. We wanted to set up the kind of the requirements first. As with the other two set asides, you can still have market units with average income. So we can see here that only 69.62% of the units are going to be under the low income set asides. And the average is going to be 54% or less. So federally, you're still going to have 40% of the low income units average 60% in each project. But state requirements, you're going to have the whole property, all the low income units average 54% of those 69.62%. I know this is a lot of percentages and they all kind of go to different things. So sometimes it might be easier to really break it down and use your land use restriction agreement and kind of do this in steps where you kind of look at the projects and then you look at the property as a whole and then you still need to maintain applicable fractions which are also outlined in your land use restriction agreement hopefully you guys that are here are familiar with this if you're not this is usually going to be at the end of your land use restriction agreement or LURA and this is going to be something that still has to be maintained even with the average income set aside so you can see in that first one the applicable fraction is 100 percent so that's easy peasy all of our buildings are 100% low income. We got to manage our average, but we're good to go as far as we don't have any markets to, to look at and kind of further add a level of difficulty to this. That second one, we have a one building property, which is also a one building project where the applicable fraction is 69.63. And we know that that one is the one that's got to have 54%. I'm not sure why there's a percentage difference since it's one building, but there was. Um, so this is the same Laura and this one we're going to look at the property and make sure that it's got a 54% average, but we're also going to make sure that our applicable fraction remains in compliance with this land use restriction agreement requirement. Oh, I forgot my circles were there. So one of the things you need to be aware of is the minimum set aside is a project rule. The applicable fraction is a building rule. And I know those sometimes get confused. Sometimes it's a lot of things that go in. We've got a lot of fractions, a lot of percentages that we've got to look at. So we wanted to be sure that there was kind of an easy reminder there. Again, the development average outlined in the land use restriction agreement is in addition to the two things on this slide. The minimum set aside is a project test, and that's the federal requirement. The applicable fraction is a building test, and that's going to be um, on that last page of the land use restriction agreement like we just looked at. And then any additional state rent and occupancy requirements are going to be a development test. So we want to be sure that if you've got that 54% or 60% that you're looking at your property as a whole for those and not just, oh, my project met it, I'm good to go. You've got to look at the property as a whole for those. So we mentioned Forms 8609. If you're new to the housing tax credit world, this might be new to you. If you've been around a minute, you've probably seen these. This is where the owner or the taxpayer, those are kind of synonymous, is going to elect the average income set aside. Additionally, this is where the owner or taxpayer is going to tell us, yes, it's part of a multiple building project or no, it's not. If this is marked yes, we would expect to see an attachment that tells us about that project and what buildings are included in it. If we don't have an attachment, but this is marked yes, we're still gonna treat this as um, an individual building project because we don't have that attachment to back up this election. And like I said a little bit ago, if you don't have 8609s yet, you will have a review that uses every building as its own project. So again, the owner, like I said on that first section where we talked about kind of the, the statute requirements for average income, the owner is responsible for reporting the average income qualified group on the annual owner's compliance report. 
So we're going to ask you, does the property use an average income minimum set aside? Yes. And you're going to be responsible for, in your books and records, some type of documentation that at the end of that tax year or end of that calendar year says, I have got these units, that's what I'm using for my 40%, and that's where that requirement is. Um, and that's usually going to be something I think that would come up between the, them and the IRS. Amy, is that correct? As long if we monitor, we're going to look at it and make sure that the 40% is met, um, but they want to have it in their books and records in case the IRS comes back with questions as far as set-asides. That's kind of a it's been a difficult thing for folks to wrap their minds around. That's one thing that I get a lot of questions on. So I think that's um, you know, an important piece to remember. So we've got our building here, and we're going to look at the federal set-aside requirements. 40% of these 12 units is five units. We're going to round up because you don't have 0.8 of a unit. So our five units that we've elected are these that are circled. The owner has elected these circled units. That average is out to be 48%. So the minimum set aside is met. And I think that's usually what you would do. You would pick your lower ones to make sure you're meeting the 60% requirement. But that's something that's going to have to be maintained on a regular basis and that you want to keep an eye on as an owner or management group or on-site person for an average income set aside property. Our next example is an individual building project where each of our buildings is its own project. We've elected our three units in each building to say this is our qualified group. Our average of those is below 60%, so our minimum set-aside requirement has been met. So we are, we are good to go on these two separate projects. Do we have questions about this one? Uh, this is not okay. Low down. Okay. Low okay. Do they need me to go back? Uh, she didn't say you had to go back. Okay. Okay. I will go back just in case. So on this one, we have one building. Maybe it's in a property with other buildings. Maybe it's its own building, um, and there's no other units. But we are focused on this one building. This is a project, so the 8609 said this is not in a project with other buildings. So we are looking at this one building, and we have got five units. So 40% of 12 is 4.8. We've rounded that up to be five. So we've taken the average of those that you can see here in the blue roof. The average is 48%. So we've added those percentages together got to get 240, divided that by five, for a 48% average. So we've met our federal minimum set aside here. For this chunk of examples, we are just looking at the federal requirements. We are not looking at the additional state. We're gonna do that in a little bit. So for this one, we've got two buildings that are part of the same property, but they're not part of the same project. So we've got to take six units and determine the 40%, which gets us three units because it's 2.4, so we round up. The owner has elected that these circled items are going to be the units that make up our qualified group in the average income testing. And so each of those circled items is below the 60% average, so our federal requirement has been met. And then if we had any, for our LURA requirements, we would have to add all of them together and make sure that all the property or all the unit designations for the property are at or below that 60% average. So now we've got an example, but we've got a but. So we're still at the average income set aside. We've still got our individual building projects, which met the requirement over here. But now we have got a property full and the property has got to have an average of 60% or below for the whole property. So now we've added all of our designations up and the average is 56.67. So we are under that LURA requirement for the whole property. Are there any other questions or anything you wanna add before we? Okay. So this one is, an, is showing how we've added all that together and we've still met our 60% requirement. So we are both complying with the federal requirement for the minimum set aside 
and the additional state rent and occupancy requirements outlined in the land use restriction agreement. Here is an example where it is a multiple building project. So we have our 12 units, but they're two different buildings. So we're gonna use these circled ones. We could pick and choose from each building to cover our federal requirement. We've added those together for a total of 260 divided by five gives us a 52% average. So federally, we are okay, we are good to go. We would still wanna test the buildings as a whole. They should all, that should be under 60% because I think I kept the same, I might've changed it, but um, they should be under 60% as a whole in order to comply with the additional state rent and occupancy requirements outlined in the land use restriction agreement. So we've got our, our 10 units now because now we have markets. So our applicable fraction is 83.33%. We've got 10 units divided by 12 units, assuming everything's the same square footage. Our applicable fraction has been met. Our minimum set aside is met because the four circled items average 60% or less. So federally, we are okay as far as this building goes. But we have a problem with our LURA required average. The LURA requires that all 10 affordable units be averaged out at 54%. And this building is at 58% or this property is at 58%. So now we've got an issue of non-compliance that we're going to have to address. So we need to probably look at our 80% and see, do they qualify at a lower amount? Did we put them in an 80 because we had that many in our, in our plan of operations? We need to um, evaluate those, maybe evaluate markets, see if they qualify um, so that we can recertify them maybe. Whatever we need to do to get that 40% average met is what we need to do because that's going to be non-compliance with regards to additional state rent and occupancy. There is an average income testing tool and we've we've actually got one that we're going to put up on the website with our average income with this webinar and then under our compliance monitoring um, forms that are available for use on that forms website and this tool is where you would put your unit status report it's going to then tell you about the average and you could tell it your required average was 60%. The actual average is 59.1667. So the requirement is met. This example represents a multiple building project. If each building is its individual project, you would, you would do one of these for each project. And then additional state rent and occupancy requirements can be tested through this tool as well. So if we had to have a state requirement of 54%, we would know through this that we were not meeting that because everything's in one project. So our project and our property testing are gonna be the same. So we would also know that that is gonna to have to be adjusted. And so we would need to evaluate some of those higher set-asides. Are there any questions or comments that you wanna add or anybody wants to add? Yeah. All right. So. As with any tax credit or any low income program, you've got income limits and rent limits. The income limits are published annually by HUD. They are project and program specific. They are based on your household size. Then the rent limits are calculated. They are also project specific and they are based on unit size. So you're gonna need to be aware of what you've got going on at your property and what your income and rent limits are. So this is an image of our new website with our income and rent limits. You would click on this link down here that says income and rent tool. That's gonna to pop up something that looks like this. For this example, we've done Travis County, 9% housing tax credits in Austin. We've got a placed in service date range and a carryover date range. So we are going to click submit and then we are going to populate our income and rent limits for this property. You can then bookmark Oh, where my mouse went. You can click that bookmark button there if you would like to, and you can save that some way if you want to do it for every property, or you can go in every year uh, when the limits come out and you can um, rerun this top part and hit submit. 
I know we know that there is not a way to put the property name on the income and rent tool. So that would be something that you guys out in the field would need to either handwrite it on there, write it on there through a PDF document, somehow indicate that that's the income and rent tool for the properties that fall under these um, date ranges and financing. So the gross rent calculation does not change with the average income set aside. You still have to take your tenant rent plus utility allowance plus mandatory fees to determine your gross rent. And your gross rent still has to be under the required set aside uh, rent limit. With average income, 20% all the way up to 80% designations are federally allowed or required. So those would all be gross rent issues if they affected the um, minimum set aside fraction or percentage that you needed to look at. So we've got our USR here. We're gonna look at unit 2201. We can see that their rent is 1,392 plus $114 utility allowance plus a $25 mandatory fee gets us a total of 1,531 for that household's rent. The limit on an 80% unit is $1,890. So we are okay. We are under that limit. So this household is in compliance with regards to the rent requirements for an 80% unit at an average income development or at this average income development. Leave that up for just a second in case anybody is writing the math down. We do have a couple of questions. Okay. Um, the first one is, so regardless of how 8B is answered, the average of the entire project must be under 60%. So the answer to that is 8B does determine what your project is and all projects must average to at or under 60%. In addition, what Kara is also talking about is our qualified allocation plan um, indicated points for certain lesser um, set-asides. Some of them are at 60, some of them are at 54, 57. Those are state rent and occupancy requirements. So think about it if you had like a 40, 60, and you also had to rent some 30s and 50s in there. Those are your state rent and occupancy restrictions. So if you have that state rent and occupancy restriction to average under 60%, that, or even at 60%, then you're gonna actually be looking at three different four different tests. You're gonna be looking to make sure you have it within your project as defined on 8B, you have a qualified group of units that is 40, that equals 40% 40 of that project. And those 40% of those 40% units average at 60. You're also going to make sure your entire project as defined on 8B averages at 60 or below. Then you're going to look at your um, entire development, not anything to do with 8B, and make sure that averages at whatever your additional state rent and occupancy requirement could, is. So that is either going to be 60 or it could be below. So hopefully that answered that question. If it didn't, please uh, feel free to put a follow up in there. If you do a follow-up question, please reference your first question because once I answer them, they disappear and I don't know what you're talking about. Um, the next question is, um, can you tell me the name of the report that Kara just said where you put the average income testing tool? So that's the, I think they're talking about this report. And that is the average income testing tool that is going to be, a, there is one up right now, but we've made a few um, adjustments to improve it for you guys. Um, and so hopefully when we get this training posted, we will be able to post that. It's kind of in the testing phase right now. We want to be sure we put something out there that, that works and doesn't have errors for you guys um, as best we can. And so Amy and I are going to work on testing that and getting that put out um, into the universe. For you guys to use as a resource you can also develop your own tool you can use your unit status report in an excel format and you can 
edit, um, you know, separate your projects out if you want to on different tabs. There's a there's a million ways you can do this, um, and you could test it that way with your percentages, so that you could, um, you know, not have to wait on us necessarily to have that tool, but that tool will be something that's available uh, to you in the very near future. Okay, we have um, someone just pointed out that you're using the one bedroom that women on the two bedroom. That's fair. And I told us that just an error on the presentation. Yep, <laughs> yep, that is fair. I will uh, make a note. Yeah, I try to be really diligent about that. My apologies. Hopefully, that's not a trend. <laughs> but it's also under the two bedroom uh, rent limit of 2268. Not sure where I got a one bedroom. Uh, anyway. So that gets us caught up on questions. I'm mm -hmm. guessing. Okay, so slide 25. Here we have one more. Are you familiar with the next available unit rule where the entire project must average to below 60 so that there is never at any time that the average ANI is above 60 during operations? I was told I need to project the average. Okay, I have. To. Okay. Amy's going to answer that one in the chat is kind of project specific or property specific. So the next one we're going to look at, hopefully I put the rent limit on the right thing. Our project average is 60%. We've got our household in 2105 that is a 30% unit. It is in a two bedroom. I did click the right rent limit on this one. So our rent is 693 plus 114 for the utility allowance plus 50 for the mandatory fee. For a total of 857. Well, now we have a problem because 857 is more than 850. So we have an issue of non-compliance with regards to this. This one would be reportable because that project was right at the 60% limit. And now we have got a 30% designation with a rent issue that means that is not part of the fraction anymore or part of the calculation. So now the new project average for this one is 62%, which means it is not meeting that minimum set aside requirement. So this would be reportable as failure to meet the minimum set aside because the, the average was required to be at, hold on, I do have a circled issue. Oh, my circle moved, that's what it is. My circle moved, it's supposed to be on 850, not on 1134. Oh no, that's the rest of this. Never mind. I promise we practiced this, but this one's a little bit different. So they're not qual they're not qualified at the 30% limit, but they are qualified at 40. So we would be able to change this one to a 40. That's what this is. But the new project average using 40% is the 62%. So I should have read my own notes. My apologies to the crowd. So now we've got a new project average of 62%, and that's the issue is now it's still a low income unit, but our average no longer meets that 60% requirement. And we would have the issue with non-compliance that would be reportable with regards to that, even though that's a 30% set aside. And I know you guys are used to that being an, um, an additional state rent and occupancy requirement for average income, because that is a federally required or allowed set aside, that would be part of the uh, reportable items. So how to correct gross rent, it's the same as your other set asides if it's determined that a housing tax credit development during the compliance period collected rent in excess of the rent limit established by the minimum set aside, the owner must correct the violation by reducing the rent charged. Then the violation corrected date would be January 1st of the following year. The refunding of overcharged rent does not avoid the disallowance of credit by the IRS. It does not prevent us from citing the non-compliance my go towards your tenant relations, but it's not going to change how that's reported. And like I said, average income encompasses all designations federally. So all rent overages are treated as reportable issues of non-compliance when the project average goes over that 60% limit. Anything you want to add to the gross rent section or any questions? I just want to point out, can you go back to, so on this one, um, Kara's right, like it is below the 40, so that's what we would now average at, but that does not mean you can change this tenant's designation. Please remember that 10.611 
does not allow you to change this designation. So if when we look at this, we say, okay, they don't have their rent restricted at a 30, um, and we change that unit to a 40 for the average, and it's still averaged below 60%. So the way this example is, it's averaging above and there's an issue, right? But say it's below, even if we change in our, like when we're averaging it out to the 40, we are still going to have a finding of non-compliance, but it would be under additional rent and occupancy requirements. And we would, because of 10.611 and 10.622, and we would ask you to reduce and refund because it would fall under that finding. So it would not be reportable because you're still averaging under 60% but you would still have non-compliance. It just would be non-reportable. So that's just the, that's the difference there in the two uh, triggers. And we're gonna look at this kind of the same or similar example, but with that allowance. So now we've got our building and our project average is 48%. So we are well under that 60% limit. 2105 is still the unit we're talking about. They are a 30% unit, 850. They are over the rent limit for a 30%, but they are under the limit for a 40%. And now the new project average is 50. So we still have non-compliance, but our non-compliance, like Amy just said, is going to be additional rent and occupancy. It's not gonna be reportable. You are gonna have to refund or credit. And we're gonna talk about that on the next slide and kind of those requirements. So this one, you still won't change their designation. You're still gonna have to reduce and refund. And you are still going to have to, um, you know, kind of work to better your policies and procedures to make sure that this doesn't happen um, on a regular recurring basis. But your project has stayed under 60%. So this is not reportable to the IRS because that set aside average has been maintained. So when we say reduce and refund, this is outlined in the 10 tax section 10.622B. You would refund or credit the excess amount collected to the affected household. You're going to calculate the amount of rent overage paid by the household. You reduce the household's rent and refund the credit, um, refund or credit the excess amount collected. You're going to update the lease contract. You're going to notify the household in writing of the rent reduction. You're going to then submit evidence to us of the rent overage calculation, a copy of the canceled check or the evidence of the account credit the updated lease contract and rent ledger and the notice to the tenants to show that it has been reduced. The non-compliance is gonna be considered corrected on the date where the overcharged rent was refunded or credited to the resident and the date that the rent plus the utility allowance is equal to or less than the applicable limit. And that should also include mandatory fees. So if the owner does not, main, does not get in writing from the household the election to receive a full check or have a credit to their account, we are going to default to the requirement to have a refund check. The election for a credit to the account for the overage has to be done by the tenant. That is not your decision to make, that is the tenant's option. So in your notification of, hey, we accidentally overcharged you rent, we're making that right, here's the amount that's due to you. Do you want that in a refund check or do you want it credited to your account? What I've been seeing is most of the time folks want it credited to their account, um, but that is still an option that they have that choice. That is not something that the owner gets to choose for the tenant. Does that cover the differences between those two rent issues? Okay, no other questions on that. All right, so now we're gonna talk about how this all impacts recertifications. This is another question that we get on a really regular basis. Project elections and annual requirements don't change just because the set aside has changed. If you are 100% housing tax credit, annual data collection is required and that can be done on the annual eligibility certification. Your policies and procedures must outline annual requirements. If you are mixed income, meaning you have market units and tax credit units, you are going to have to do full annual income certifications for the project that contains those market units. Policies and procedures must outline annual requirements. So this is where Amy was talking about that changes in a household designation thing. 
this is applicable if a development has adopted a policy in accordance with 10.611 little c of the um, 10 tax <clears throat> relating to determination, documentation, certification of annual income. So your policies and procedures need to outline how you're gonna handle that. If you're 100% development, you are not required to income certify those households again, unless they move from one project to another. Um, but if you are at a mixed income development, you are going to have to annually qualify these households or annually certify the households. And if designations are gonna change, that needs to be outlined in your policy and it needs to be in accordance with the requirements of that 10.611 that Amy referenced and it's referenced here on the slide. But also remember a household's lowest designation as recorded on the income certification at the time of move in cannot be increased unless the household was found to have never income qualified for the unit, no longer income qualifies for the unit or the program rules require the change. So you wanna be sure that you are covering all your bases on that if your policies and procedures require that these are gonna change for your households. Are there any recertification questions yet or anything you wanna to add to those? Um, we do have a question and it's just, I'm just gonna, probably reiterate a little bit what you're saying here. So the question was with the rent, why in the second example is it non-compliance if the average still meets the requirement? It is state, it is a state finding. It is not a reportable finding. So, and it is because of 10.611 where you can't change the designation unless those things apply. So then the follow up to that was, what if the resident's income goes over 40% at resort? Can it then be changed to a 40% and the rent changed to 40%? And the answer to that is yes, as long as the plan, the tenant selection criteria outlines your recertification requirements so that the tenant fully understands that at, that you are doing a full recertification and during that full recertification, if their income does exceed the 30%, they will be changed to the 40 or the 50 or the 60 or the 70 or the 80, wherever they tend to fall, and their rent will follow that. If they understand that and that is written in your tenant selection plan, you can do that because that would um, say that they are, that would open up your 40s and your wait list, and that's what you want to do or what you would hope to do, but you're not required to. You can keep them at the 40. Um, and sometimes if you don't have to do full recertifications, like the 100% tax credits, um, they would just do the annual data collection. So you would never know if they would stay at a 40. Um, and so no, one, then they said, once the units are set, must they stay the same designations? No, M, your, your designations float. You just want to make sure that you're always meeting your 60% or below average. So I hope that answered those questions. And if it didn't, please do a follow-up. Um, the next question is, if the property is 100% housing tax credit, but they do not have 8609s yet, are they required to do full recertifications until the 8609s are received? And the answer to that is not for state requirements but please remember um, you do have owners and syndicators that, that may have more strict requirements than what is federally or state required and they are just trying to protect the assets. So um, I have seen um, Lisa and the first year they want the first recertification and it, it's not unallowable, they can always be more restrictive. So you may have an owner or syndicator that would like to do that. It's not required to do that. And yes, and it, to piggyback off of that, if you want to be sure you're covering the state requirements and your owner and syndicator requirements, you can do an AEC along or an annual data collection along with that full income certification. So if we come wow. out and monitor, no. Wow. Don't do what a waste. But if we come out and monitor and the research, the full research's not done, but the AEC is done, then we don't have a state issue at all. Why wouldn't it not be done? I don't know. Requirement. I've had it happen before, but they did the AEC, just so it was done. Okay, Amy says just do the full cert and have it done on time. Don't do that. 
<laughs> so annual requirements for 100% low income project, everybody completes annual data collection. And you can do that on the annual eligibility certification. We have that available on our website. Now we've got a mixed income project. Everybody has to complete a full income certification. Even though we have one building where it's all low income, we have one building in the project with markets. And if a project has even one market, that whole project has to have full recertifications done every year. So this is an area where knowing your election on line 8B and some owners get very creative on how their buildings are mixed. So you wanna be sure you know which buildings go with which buildings and what the designations are in them. And even though that first building there is all low income, you would still not be able to do an AEC for that one or an annual data collection because there are markets in the project. And so you've got to do full income certifications annually for these. Now we've got two projects. One is all low income and one is mixed income. For building one, we can do annual data collection because everybody is a low income tenant there and, and that is what's required. Um, this isn't one where we've just qualified a market accidentally. Everybody's low income. Now, building two is the only building that has to do full annual income certifications because now our markets are only in that project. They're not in both projects or they're not in the one project as a whole. They're two different projects. So the average income minimum set aside, like we talked about, has all the different designations. It's got 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, and 80. The 140% threshold for 60% and anything less than that is gonna be at the 140% of the 60% limit. 70% and 80% units are going to have that 140% threshold set at their limit. So you can see that some of them are, you're gonna have a bunch of them at the 60% limit at 140% of 60% to go over income or OI. 70s and 80s are gonna be OI when they go over 140% of the 70 or 80% limit, whichever is applicable. So, Section 10.615 kind of outlines this. The department's gonna examine the gross, the actual gross rent, tenant portion plus utility allowance plus mandatory fees and income levels of all households to determine if the additional income and rent requirements for the LURA are met. The department is also gonna look at the gross rent and income for all households to determine if the developments elected the average income set aside have met the federal requirements for any lower additional occupancy requirements. So we've talked about that 54% that might be required. That's kind of, that's this. The department is also gonna monitor the available unit rule as outlined below for the developments that elected the average income minimum set aside. So we just talked about the 140% limit. Owners are not required to terminate the tenancy of over income households. When the unit occupied by an over income household is vacated, it must be reoccupied by a household with an income or rent level equal to or less than the rent level of the household that went over income. In addition, the unit must be reoccupied by a household that restores the low income average to the project at 60% or less. And we've got several um, examples with the available unit rules. So that's gonna be explained again. So when a household goes over income, you will keep it rent restricted at the limit that they were at you will lease the next unit of smaller or comparable size to a low income household. The above items have to continue until the applicable fraction is restored in the building. So there might be instances where one or two or three even units have to be occupied in order to restore this. The available unit rule is a building rule. So you are going to look at these on a building basis. We've got our example here. These are individual building projects. So building one over there with a 50% 56% average is fine. It has met its minimums. It's, it's doing what it's supposed to be doing. But building two certified an 80% household and determined that the household was over income. The one market unit in this building is vacant. The next household moved into the market unit must be a qualified low income household that restores the project average and applicable fractions. But we messed up. We accidentally moved a market back into that market unit. 
five days after our other household went over income. It happens, we get it, so we need to fix it. So before we were supposed to be at 83.3%, now our OI unit is a market unit and our new applicable fraction is 66.67%. So now we have a set aside that is met, but non-compliance with our applicable fraction. So, oh, it's the next one where we have all the non-compliance list out. So now we've got kind of the same scenario, but we've got a 30% unit that got a big promotion. They are over income. So they have gone over the 140% limit of the 60% AMI limit. We also accidentally moved in our market unit five days later. So now our 30% unit is a market. We are no longer meeting our project average or our applicable fraction. So we have got several issues of non-compliance here. The first issue is our market unit is cited as an ineligible household as of 9-6. The 30% over income unit is cited as violation of the next available unit rule on 9-6. The 80% household is cited as an ineligible household because the project no longer averages 60% AMI, but the minimum set aside is still being met. So in this, we've got four low income units, 40% of four is two unit. We are gonna have um, our two added together to get 55%. So we are still meeting the federally required set aside. Is there anything you wanna add on the available unit rule for the income issues? Okay. Now what happens if you have a full-time student household move in or recertify? Hopefully you're not moving them in. This should in theory be something at recertification because you're diligent at move-in for sure. So we've got a full-time student. The student eligibility rules did not change just because it's an average income deal. Our 80% household recertified and now they've told us they're all full-time students and they don't meet an exception. Our applicable fraction was 83.3%. Now with this non-compliance, it's 75%. So we have an issue. The average is still being met but we are no longer meeting our applicable fraction. So that unit that went, that became a full-time student household is gonna be cited as an ineligible student household. And we are going to uh, cite that non-compliance and that would have to be corrected. Now we've got our 30% unit that's a full-time student household as of 9-1. Our average is no longer being met. Neither is our applicable fraction. So we've got some issues of non-compliance. We've got our 30% unit cited as an ineligible full-time student household as of 9-1. The 80% unit is cited as an ineligible household as of 9-1, because that's what threw our building out of fraction or out of um, the average. But our minimum set aside is still being met at an average of 57.5%. So we don't have a federal minimum set aside requirement, but we do have those top two issues of non-compliance there. Any questions before we talk about layered program? Bring so up. yes, we do okay. have a question. It is about, uh, well, it's more of a student question, not really an average question, so I'll answer it. Okay. What else? Or anything you wanted to add on these? No. Okay. So with regards to average income being layered with other programs, you still have to meet all program requirements for, for all programs. So if you've got average income and bond or average income and a home program, you've got to meet those requirements. The bond program at this time does not recognize 70% and 80% designations as low income. Therefore, for the bond program, Full income recertifications would have to be implemented if you have those 70 and 80% designations at your average income and bond properties. As monitors, we're going to look at the average income housing tax credit requirements and any other program requirements. We're going to look at them kind of separately. They don't always overlap perfectly or neatly. And I understand sometimes that has a frustrating factor, but that is still something that has to be managed and maintained. So you're still gonna wanna look at 
each program separately, just as you would with any other set aside. Annual certification requirements must be met for all programs. So we're gonna look at a bond example where it's kind of not a perfect layering and we're gonna talk about that. Programs that are layered, even when they are not department programs, must be operated individually, individually and concurrently. So if you have bond from another provider or from another entity, we're not going to look at the bond requirements. We're gonna look at your average income housing tax credit set aside requirements. And um, that's how we're gonna monitor, but you're gonna have to talk to your bond folks about what they require with that layered program. So here we've got an example of a housing tax credit with average income, and it's a mixed income deal, and it's layered with bond. The bond, 100% of the units are eligible tenants, with 40% of those units being designated at the 60% income limit. So our housing tax credit designations range from 20 to 80%. Our bond designations, we've got 48 units that are 60% AMI, and then we've got 71 units that are designated as eligible tenants under the bond program. That is able to be done on your unit status report. So they should not all be 60% bond units. Um, you should evaluate which 48 are gonna be in your bond 60% limit and which 71 are gonna be your eligible tenants. If you've got the 70 and 80% designations on your housing tax credit households, those are going to have to be in your eligible tenant households for your bond program. So it, it is following the tax credit stuff, but it is also following the bond stuff. And because bond does not recognize the average income set aside at this time, it does not mirror it perfectly like it might do um, in some other programs. So 70 and 80% designations are not considered low income under the bond program. So here's what that looks like if it's 100% tax credit and bond at the same setup as we had on the previous slide. So now we are 100% housing tax credit. Our bond designations are 48 units at the 60% area median income limit. 71 units are eligible tenants. Our average has to meet the 60%. So we've done all that testing. Now we're looking at our designations. If you've got the designations that are ranging from 20 to 80%, those 70% and 80% units have got to be eligible tenants. And because of the, the fact that bond does not recognize those as low income, the 48 units that are designated as 60% under the bond program have got to perform full annual income certifications because the property is not 100% at 60% or less under the housing tax credit program. Is there anything else you wanna to add to that? Or Carolyn, did you wanna jump in on any of that? Hearing none, I will assume no. So there are a few reminders with regards to average income, and then we've got plenty of time to answer any questions or Amy can jump in or any other staff that's on can jump in about average income. Uh, the training was not intended as a comprehensive tax credit training. We did not discuss the whole operation of an affordable housing community. Um, all requirements, federal and state, must be met in order to comply with the program. All low-income households must be properly certified in order to qualify for any designation other than a market, and rents must remain restricted. The unit status report should reflect the correct designation as selected on the income certification. All reporting requirements must be met as outlined in TINTAC section 10.607. So that's your annual owner's compliance report, your quarterly vacancy report, your reports due when there is um, a monitoring review or a physical inspection. Record keeping requirements are still um, have to be met as outlined in TINTAC section 10.608. And those are program specific. So if you have multiple programs, you're gonna have multiple record keeping requirements. Written policies and procedures and affirmative fair housing marketing plan requirements remain in place. You wanna contact the fair housing group with any questions and you can do that at fair.housing at tdhca.texas.gov with any questions. It is imperative that the unit status report be current and correct with all set-asides, but especially with the average income set-aside so that at any time we go in to test, it is going to have the accurate designations based on what the households or qualified at or certified at. Um, and if you have an owner that does not wanna have the 20% under the tax, under the average income, you wanna have 30s, 40s, 
60s and 80s, that's fine as long as they all average out accordingly, but you can have all of those designations. Um, and one of the articles that I read in preparation for this had a really good example about um, a property that elected average income where a sister property had the 40 at 60 and was having to turn away folks like teachers who didn't, who weren't under the 60% limit, but would have qualified at the 70% or 80%. So that average income property that is a sister property is now able to house those folks that are necessary to the area and have every right and um, you know ability to live in the area, um, but now they get to do it at an affordable rate or at an affordable housing um, community. Um, so that being said, uh, it is still very, very hot. I don't know what part of Texas or what part of the United States you are in. Don't ask me about geography. We talked about that last month. It is not where my brain goes. Um, so this concludes the average income presentation. We got plenty of time for questions. Um, we're at 10.04 and we don't have to shift gears till 10.30, but we can shift earlier if we don't have any average income questions or anything you guys want to add. watching it it's not blinking yet mouse fell asleep there it goes okay Kara are you going to post this video after the training this video will be posted. It'll probably be late next week. Um, we do want to test that average income testing tool that we want to offer as a resource to you guys. So we will get that testing done and um, this will be, it takes a little bit for it to convert and it will be posted. I always like to give myself a week, but it might be as early as Monday and it might be as late as next Friday. So bear with us. Um, the announcement for the October Office hours is gonna go out next week. So that'll be open for registration. Um, can I go ahead and tell them the topic? Okay, the October topic is gonna to be HOTMA and kind of what we've seen this year, what you guys have asked questions about, kind of how that all works, what resources we've set up for you guys, um, and then kind of just an overview of the actual HOTMA requirements. It kind of gets into the nitty gritty of it with some examples um, straight out of the HOTMA guidance. So it's a little bit different than the other trainings we've done with regards to that, um, but like I said, that announcement will go out. That is actually gonna be held not the second Friday. We're gonna have to push that um, because my, my kiddo's school district has decided that October 11th is a holiday. I'm not sure what it actually is. Um, so we're gonna push that to October 18th. So that announcement will go out next week with registration information. Um, I believe Carolyn Metzger is gonna help me with that one. I think it's Columbus. Oh, I thought that was the sixth. But that's close know. to the 11th. I don't know. I might be making that up. Our school district puts lots of holidays in. They're they're also out on Monday the 23rd, and I don't know what significance that day has. So, well, that, we do have a question. It okay. says, "How would it work if the property is a single project with one building where the land use restriction agreement mandates 100% applicable fraction? So that means every unit in your development or in this project, which is the development, it's a single project development, one building, would have to be low income. You have no market. And your set aside is based on average income. That means that you would have every unit would be low income and you would have to 40% of that building, of the units in that building, however, however many there are, say it's a 10 unit building, that would be four of them, would have to average to 60%. In addition, the entire building or project, which this is all one thing and this one is interchangeable, would have to average at or below 60%. And if your land use restriction agreement required a lower um, average for state Requirement, yep. then you would have to average also that entire project at or below whatever that number is. So you would have multiple working parts going on in there. And I can tell you in building this training, this is easier to look at and explain when there's an actual property with actual unit status reports and 
lures and everything in place. Um, it was very difficult, so to speak, to put it together conceptually. So I did use, you know, real properties. Um, so if you thought, oh, that's that's my percentage, maybe that was your land use restriction agreement. Um, the next question is, with the layering of the bond program, if short-term bonds are utilized, does that avoid the annual recertification if the project includes a market rate unit? So the bond that we are talking about is our bond and those requirements usually go throughout the whole state restrictive period. Um, some of our bond deals have requirements that kind of change during the state restrictive period, but for the most part, we see that the same requirement during the qualified project period remains throughout the state restrictive period. If you have bond funding from another entity, then you would want to reach out to them to find out what their requirements are. And an exciting news, we are going to have a bond training that is going to be specific to TDHCA bonds uh, towards the end of October. That announcement will go out in the next couple of weeks with registration information. Um, you, we, we hear you guys when you ask for trainings. It just sometimes takes me a minute to get them put together, um, but the bond training is coming. So keep on the lookout for that if you have TDHCA bonds. Um, and if you have other training necessities or needs, you can always um, look at the trainings that we do in conjunction with the Texas Apartment Association. You can register for any of the ones that we put out. Um, we do office hours regularly. We also have other trainings that we put out periodically. Um, everything that we do that is a training gets posted on our website on the presentations page of our website and they are all there with their handouts available uh, for you to review and use as a resource. Um, in the event that you you have a follow-up question or you think, oh, I really don't know how to work out the real estate as an asset kind of a thing. So those are all available there. Um, I'm not seeing anything else coming through. I just put the link in the chat to the presentations page, just in case, because um, earlier someone said that they were having a hard time with the links from the presentation. So oh, I, I think you have to, it's a, it's a weird copy and paste and it adds a space or something. I'm not sure exactly what the problem is, but my technical expertise kind of ends there. All right. What else you got about average income? I'm not seeing anything. So seeing nothing, I think we are probably good to shift gears. If you are staying on with us for the open forum office hours and you think of an average income question, feel free to ask it. If you have it, if you have the question, so does somebody else and maybe they are too timid to ask it or they didn't realize they had the question. Uh, sometimes that has, that's how it goes with me and I think, oh wait, I ran into that same thing and I'm glad somebody asked that. So that is always a resource to you. Um, we are gonna take a break till about 10.15 and we will shift gears. I am gonna stop the recording now. This will be posted um, within a week. So please keep a lookout for that. We will send an announcement when it's posted. And for those of you staying on with us for the open forum, please do not feel like you have to log out. You are welcome to log out and come back, but you do not have to. We will break for about five minutes so I can shift gears. And then we will see you all again in a moment.